continuing on the powers and responsibilities the president has, uh, one of the ones that's mentioned in the Constitution itself under Article 2 uh, is he has the uh, ability to consult his advisors. Um, so the executive branch, obviously, the president can't oversee everything across the entire federal government. Uh, so what they have is uh, the executive branch has set up several departments. Um, and at those, in those, some of those departments, it's actually even more complex than that. It's that they have departments and there's sub-departments and subcommittees within those departments. But nonetheless, um, the president's kind of in charge of helping establish at least the tops of those hierarchies in those uh, departments. Uh, and they, of course, stretch down along to, to uh, cover and encompass the, the various uh, departments and how they, how they stretch in, uh, across the, the, the nation and the economy and uh, the military and all the... Uh, uh, portions, I guess they're sections of the country that are uh, administered or which law is executed. So um, uh, he has the right to, uh, or she has the right to pick these advisors and, and, and consult with them uh, on decision making because there's nobody that's a, the, an expert in every single field. Uh, so they, they ideally would draw their advice from these selected advisors. So the president has the authority to uh, choose and take advice uh, from these advisors. So uh, I do want to mention first that these uh, advisors at the top, uh, they're called generally called secretaries, uh, members of the cabinet. Um, these cabinet members, they, uh, the president chooses them, but the Senate, uh, of course, is going to have to actually appoint them, uh, just like with the justices. Uh, but the president can dismiss them uh, at his or her own pleasure. So um, <clears throat> what we have here is the uh, ability to uh, ability to choose and uh, take advice uh, from selected advisors. Um, after George Washington, uh, he, he selected what he called cabinet members. And uh, that's what they're known as now. <coughs> those uh, departments have expanded the number of cabinet members that are there, but nonetheless, these are members that work uh, directly into the president, uh, and they oversee and, and sort of act as the president with his or her authority within those departments. Uh, but of course, the, the president can have a final say in those uh, whatever departments they are. So right now we actually have 15, so let me keep going here. So uh, those are called, uh, referred to as cabinet members. Cabinet members, and those cabinet members, uh, we currently have uh, 15 as of the time of recording this video, currently. Uh, we're not going to go over all 15 because that would be a, uh, a ridiculous amount of time to dedicate to this. We'll go over the most, what's generally considered the most important four uh, departments, but there are uh, departments for like the uh, Department of the State, uh, the uh, Department of Defense, the Department of Justice and the Department of the Treasury. All of those uh, have head officials that the president uh, chooses and then of course is uh, approved by the Senate. So uh, I'll refer to his cabinet members. Uh, and this was of course a trend started by Washington, GW. Uh, but then uh, Ronald Reagan in the 80s is going to enhance this a bit uh, by adding a bunch of sub cabinet subcommittees uh, to it. Adds sub members, subcommittees. Uh, so that's going to expand into some subdivisions uh, because as the bureaucracy and administration gets more and more complex, as you know, we have more and more uh, incorporation of ideals in the internet and, and uh, the population expands and the uh, economy and military expand uh, throughout the world, uh, throughout U.S. history, uh, we have more and more need for additional administrators and advisors uh, to, to handle that. All right, so we uh, Make sure I got it all here. Uh, cabinet members uh, chosen, oh, approved by um, Senate. So let's say uh, chosen by President of the United States uh, and confirmed by Senate. All right, <clears throat> um, these are uh, officials that the the president can uh, dismiss uh, at his or her own pleasure. So the Senate approves them, but the president can dismiss them whenever he or she wants. Uh, they don't need Senate approval for, for a dismissal. Uh, so I will say uh, president can dismiss uh, or uh, listen at own pleasure. So what are advice they have? Obviously the president doesn't have to take it. 
uh, and they can they have the the final say uh, if they want in any of these departments but like i said these are generally highly specialized uh, departments and there's almost no person on earth let alone a politician that is an expert in all of these fields uh, so they generally choose from uh, people and experts in those fields to put as these heads, department, uh, heads of um, these departments. Um, uh, they do generally tend to pick along partisan lines, uh, but nonetheless, they are usually almost always qualified uh, officials for that job. Well, I shouldn't say almost always, but they are generally uh, qualified for the actual position, uh, and they're generally approved by the Senate for the most part, if they accept. Um, they pay ar around, um, these cabinet members pay around 200 k I can't remember the exact range. It's, it's low 200Ks for the job. So most of them can make more money uh, in their fields doing other things, but they choose to take this because of the, well, the prestige of it um, and the, uh, the, the experience and opportunity. All right, <clears throat> so these are the cabinet members. So we'll go over the ones that are the uh, most common. Oh, but real quickly, I want to say uh, most of them, uh, you'll hear the, the name secretary, and we don't need, mean like a clerical office secretary. That's actually a pretty new um, use of the word. The, the original word goes back to uh, Great Britain, uh, which actually means like holder of secrets. Um, so it doesn't mean that they're like, you know, the heads of intelligence agencies, although uh, at least a couple of them are. Uh, but they, of course, are gonna divulge all information about what's going on in these departments, although they are public departments. Um, but they're the ones that are supposed to at least know about all of the uh, overall happenings of the department in the state. Uh, and in the case of some of the defense ones or, or homeland security, they actually are legitimately holding on to uh, secrets national for national security. Uh, that, that's more so what the, the term itself means. So they are uh, headed generally, not all of them have the title. Like for example, the Department of Justice is headed by the Attorney General, Secretary is included in that. Uh, but I'll say most headed by, most uh, uh, given title of Secretary. Of, and then whatever department it is, or of the whatever department it is. Um, and again, that's uh, more so having to do with the word like secret possessor of secrets, uh, like a like a head, not not the clerical secretary. Okay, so we'll go over a couple of these. Um, well, we'll go over four of them actually. The, the four most common. Uh, the one uh, that is generally considered, well, they, they all four are considered the, the most significant. You can make an argument for any of the four, but we'll just go in the. Um, in the order that I randomly choose. So uh, we have the, for the Department of the State, that's one cabinet position, one of the 15 of the state. This is a particularly important one because this is the one that handles the United States relations with other countries. And as time has gone on, that's become increasingly more important. It was important right away because uh, right, right out the gate, we had some major world powers that uh, were in the region Spain, France, Great Britain, for example. Um, so we had to have some sort of um, foreign relations with them and communication so that we weren't um, constantly bickering with or, or under threat of war uh, with, these, with these great powers at the time. But as time's gone on, uh, those powers and their influence has waned uh, and ours has grown here in the United States. And now the United States is uh, uh, spread across uh, the entirety of the uh, world for the most part, not as an empire per se, uh, but just as far as being directly involved or communicating with uh, certain countries in some capacity. Some legal, some illegal, some you would consider moral or immoral, certainly. I'm not making any uh, suggestions about uh, uh, the morality of this, but the United States does have a presence, uh, for better or for worse, in almost all countries in the, United, in the uh, world. So uh, the Department of State, they are uh, in charge of, and, and by the way, the, the selection of the president for this is known as the Secretary of State. And it's very common, by the way, for uh, presidential candidates uh, to have been former secretaries or heads of these cabinet departments. And that's generally a good thing to have on your resume. Uh, it shows that you have uh, experience um, in the executive high ups of the executive branch, uh, and that can definitely help your uh, campaign ballot. Okay, so Secretary of State, so here's the, what they are dealing with. So they are dealing with um, uh, foreign relations um, and um, what's another way I can phrase this? 
foreign relations and I should say foreign policy and international relations. That makes more sense. Foreign policy. So how we interact with um, other nations and our borders uh, and then uh, international relations, what sort of relationships we have with those other countries. So who we are or aren't letting in and, and how we trade with them uh, and then uh, where whether we are allies or not with a certain group uh, or sorry country or it could be a group like the, the EU for example. Uh, those are what this uh, generally is going to cover. So the Secretary of State, uh, as with all these secretaries, I don't think I put it up here, but they should have. Um, they are generally granted, uh, uh, assumed to have presidential authority within own department. So the Secretary of State, for the most part, uh, has a is a very influential member uh, of, or you say the most influential member of the Department of the State. They're the ones that can have, they're kind of like the number two to the president. Um, and in many cases, they're sort of trusted for the most part to manage the department and then just keep the president informed on what they see are as key issues. And of course, if they're not, if they fall short in some capacity, they don't inform the president enough or whatever, uh, they uh, could certainly be removed by the president at their own discretion. Um, so generally speaking, again, they, they sort of have presidential authority within their own department, but only their department. And they are answerable, of course, uh, and, and do have to keep the uh, president informed. They have cabinet meetings, by the way, where uh, some or all of the members of the cabinet will come and give the president updates on what's going on uh, and what policies they're pursuing. And of course, the president's going to have preferences on, oh, I want immigration policy or, or our trade relations to go this way. And it's up to the secretary of the state to sort of make sure that happens within the the Department of the State. Um, so among some of the things that they do um, are going to be um, things like they uh, are going to negotiate uh, foreign treaties, international treaties. Now, if you remember from the legislative branch portion, you're like, oh, I thought the Senate did that. No, the Senate's the one that approves them. Uh, the Senate could draft one, certainly. But a lot of the times, the uh, details of the treaties are going to be uh, hammered out or even introduced by uh, the executive branch, whether it's the president uh, drafting them themselves, uh, but usually it's going to be a task delegated to uh, the Department of the State, uh, and they're going to be the ones that are communicating with uh, the um, uh, international country or other entity, uh, and they're going to be the ones that try to negotiate uh, the terms, and then of course the Senate has to approve any sort of treaty that's going to be uh, being made. Uh, they're also going to be the ones that uh, participate in diplomatic missions. And you're like, what does that mean? Well, there's several different ways they can do this, but to make this the most simple, they are the ones that organize and, uh, 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 what's the word I'm looking for? Host uh, ambassadors. So we have uh, relations with well over 100 countries in the world where we actually have a sitting ambassador, meaning there's a, a US embassy and there's a US ambassador to that country. And that's supposed to be the communication uh, through which the president of the United States takes with that country. Um, so they, that's where they would be saying, hey, uh, we think this needs to happen, or hey, uh, do you need help with this sort of thing? Or hey, we're gonna be doing this in the region. Um, uh, we're concerned about this development. That's how they communicate through there. And they're the ones that go on those diplomatic missions. Uh, and the president actually is the one that chooses ambassadors, which also get approved uh, by the Senate as well. Um, what else did I want to talk about? Diplomatic missions. Um, Oh, Secretary of State, they are the representative for the U.S. in the United Nations, which in case you don't know what that is, it's the international, uh, well, you say global organization that tries to maintain uh, peace, certainly amongst superpowers, um, and uh, to avoid nuclear war. And they also now have sort of expanded their, uh, I guess you say, mission statement from just, from solely being based on maintaining peace, which is still a part of it, but also to providing aid um, uh, to the world and, and helping reduce poverty. Uh, and also, uh, they have a lot of environmental goals. Um, that's uh, uh, the person that represents the United States at the UN, uh, generally speaking. And, um, oh yeah, and obviously, the secretary is gonna be the one that's going to advise uh, the president uh, on global issues. So that's what they handle. Okay, um, and that's the Department of the State, and that, that's enough about that particular department. But if it's anything having to do with foreign entities or international relations, that's going to be a part of this um, uh, 
Secretary of the State's uh, and Department the Secretary of the State's authority, jurisdiction, uh, and the uh, Department of the State. Uh, so that's one of them. Uh, another one we'll go to is the um, we'll go to the Department of Defense. There we go. Department of Defense. Okay, and the uh, heading, heading uh, person for that one, of course, the Secretary of Defense. And this is almost everything dealing with our uh, military uh, for the most part. So this is going to focus mostly on military operations and national defense. Now we actually have a Department of Homeland Security, which is much more domestically focused, involved with like, um, it's not the only department involved with it, but they're involved a lot with immigration and immigration enforcement, especially on at, uh, uh, ports and um, airports. Uh, and they're, they're, they're supposed to be more so counterterrorism, particularly domestic terrorism. Uh, that's a new department um, uh, from the 21st century with 9-11 attacks. But um, Secretary of Defense is the one uh, that's going to head the defense department. They're the ones that are primarily concerned with military operations uh, and intelligence uh, and funding. So this is Secretary of Defense. Uh, some of their responsibilities are going to be, of course, they are going to uh, um, be the head administrator. So how can I rephrase this? They're the ones that um, delegate the military branches, meaning Army, Navy, Air Force. Um, their, their headquarters is at the Pentagon that military building uh, that's uh, just outside the Capitol in Virginia, I believe is where the actual city that's in. Um, they're the ones that deal with um, uh, the defense spending. So defense spending, spending, funding. So they're the ones that um, are part of what we mentioned earlier with that military industrial complex uh, that, that uh, has drawn some criticism. Uh, they're the ones that uh, get the budget from Congress and they uh, distribute contracts uh, throughout the uh, private sector uh, for research and development and production of military weapons and other military uh, uh, topics. And they are, of course, going to be a large part of the funding uh, for some of the uh, universities that are developing um, military technologies. Like I know traditionally one, a big one's been MIT, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology uh, was a big one. Um, other roles they have, I mentioned the contracts, the discretionary spending. Um, oh, intelligence agencies. And no, I'm not talking about universities. I mean uh, intelligence agencies as in espionage uh, and, and spying for the most part. Some illegal, some, in, some legal. But they're basically the heads. Under them are departments that are trying to deal with what are other countries doing secretly and, and uh, both conspicuously and inconspicuously. Um, like they're trying to hide it or they're not trying to hide it. Uh, so we're trying to find out what they're actually doing in the world, uh, both what can be seen and what they're trying to hide, uh, so that we can uh, avoid it if it's negative, or we can stop it if it's negative, uh, or we can uh, try to um, uh, weather whatever sort of storm there might be. So if, for example, if there's hackers from North Korea or China or Russia, uh, these intelligence agencies are the ones that are trying to identify it, stop it. But then they're also trying to hack into or find out what the intentions of other countries are doing. Uh, and um, they're also the ones that uh, can or, or do deal with um, our presence in other countries where we're maybe trying to fund or strip funds from a regime we do or don't like, depending on their uh, humanitarian record uh, or potentially certainly less morally economic interests in the region. Uh, that's the department that is going to be handled uh, here. Uh, so that's a, a major, uh, a significant, um, uh, this cabinet department uh, of course has a significant amount of uh, power and authority uh, and importance. Uh, and I should mention by the way that um, the uh, Secretary of Defense has to have been uh, seven years removed from military uh, uh, commission. So oftentimes they're going to have been in the military at one point, uh, whatever officer, but they have to be at least seven years out because we want to maintain that civilian run military, right? We don't want the people making the decisions for the military um, being a part of that military that would, that would almost certainly lead to a military dictatorship or, or junta. 
Um, so that, of course, is going to be part of maintaining that civilian run military. Uh, and by the way, uh, just, just as a quick reminder, that means that <clears throat> the decisions are in the hands of publicly elected officials, not members of the military. So the military is subservient to the government, meaning the government and the publicly elected officials determine what or when the, the military takes action. The details of the action, obviously, are gonna be run by the professionals in the military, but uh, they, don't, they don't have the go-ahead unless they get the go-ahead on any particular operation from a publicly elected official or um, and a person appointed by a publicly elected official, which would be, of course, you know, like the Secretary of Defense or, or some lower um, part of that hierarchy. All right, that's, the, uh, that's two of the four we're gonna talk about, and now let's do uh, two more really quickly, or we'll try to do it really quickly. All right. <clears throat> so two more departments. We'll do the Department of Justice. Department of Justice. So Department of Justice, this one's going to be head by the Attorney General. Notice this one doesn't have the name Secretary. Uh, and the Attorney General and Department of Justice have to deal with, uh, of course, administering justice uh, and enforcing the law uh, for the most part. So these are the ones that, well, I guess I just use the words that I use right there. They enforce the law, enforce and administer U.S. Uh, law. So these guys aren't the courts that would, would try you for a crime. They're the ones that try to uh, obtain evidence um, and issue warrants and arrests and, and arrest you based on probable cause. Um, and they'll, they're the ones that present that uh, in, in criminal cases, so uh, uh, at least federal uh, criminal cases. So again, they're, they're not going to try you, but they're the ones that do arrest you and try to uh, prove that you are guilty. Um, and then, of course, they do have constitutional restrictions, which are generally followed. Um, and it's up to the Department of Justice, to, uh, or sorry, not the Department of Justice. It's up to the uh, judiciary branch to determine you know, if you are guilty and if they violated some, some, some form of, of some constitutional right. <clears throat> so um, some of the federal departments that they're the head of for enforcing these laws, uh, which you've probably heard of, uh, they are the heads with, under their... <clears throat> Within their department, they uh, have the FBI, Federal Bureau of Investigation, uh, the uh, Federal Marshals. Those are like the federal police. So you actually have federal and state police that uh, enforce the, they're kind of like the arm of the um, federal judiciary and the state judiciary. And then you have local police, which you probably know of as like, you know, sheriffs and various police departments uh, or, or highway patrol in California, California Highway Patrol. But the state police would be above them technically because uh, they're the enforcement of state law and the, the hand of the uh, state courts. And then the marshals uh, would be the federal police that would have, uh, in case of a dispute between uh, you know, a state and a federal uh, policeman, the, the federal uh, generally have the, um, <clears throat> the authority. They certainly do initially. They might be discovered later they don't for a particular reason. Uh, but they, just like the federal government versus state government conflict, if there's an issue between them over uh, which... Uh, which, per, which, which policy takes precedence, it's gonna um, go federal uh, in our federation. So these are the federal police. <clears throat> they like the extension of the, uh, uh, like I said, the federal courts. <clears throat> what else do they got? Um, these are also the ones that would head the, um, um, the war on drugs. Uh, they're the ones that would be uh, trying to allocate, uh, or not allocate, find evidence for and, and, and stop drug trafficking within the United States. So uh, drug uh, um, uh, enforcement, as well as alcohol and other things. What else are they in charge of that we could talk about that's relevant to, you would know? Oh, uh, they have to do with, um, they're, they're looking for a lot of uh, federal charges of uh, like financial fraud, for example. Financial fraud. And they also fund and manage the um, uh, federal prison system. <clears throat> which is a complicated issue with the uh, uh, involvement of, uh, of, of, of private prisons that are contracted by the federal government. And there's, of course, varying degrees of, of quality and treatment within those prisons, which is definitely a, a hot issue and, 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 a, and a valid one. Uh, but they're, they're the ones that would technically be in charge of monitoring that uh, and, and regulating that. So, and funding it. 
Uh, so those are kind of the, those are some, some roles they have. One thing they do not do though, so don't get this confused, they're not in charge of, I think I mentioned this earlier, they're not in charge of immigration. Uh, that's under the Homeland Security Department. Uh, so like ICE, uh, for example, and, and those that, that patrol and monitor the borders, uh, that's not the Department of Justice. This is just for domestic issues. If it's immigration related, as far as who's coming in and all that, I, I think I said, I think I mentioned this earlier, uh, that would be um, Homeland Security that covers that. Um, if you are trying to get citizenship though, uh, legally and, and all that, <clears throat> um, uh, or, or seek some sort of refugee status, uh, that would be, at least the terms for that would be set and uh, determined by the Department of State. The actual borders and ones that will receive you and filter you would be um, um, uh, the uh, Homeland Security, and then if you're a citizen, um, then you would be under the auspices of the uh, federal government, federal law, or state law, but in this case, federal, uh, and that would be the Department of Justice handled. So what does the Eternal Attorney General do? Uh, this is actually the chief lawyer <clears throat> for the U.S. So they're going to represent the United States in federal cases, like, uh, for example, uh, they could uh, represent the United States in one of the federal district courts or the Supreme Court. Um, and they're also going to uh, be, so whenever you see like uh, like the United States versus Nixon, uh, that, that's gonna be a, a case where, I'm not actually sure in the details if they had the Attorney General represent the United States there because there might be a conflict of interest since Nixon appointed him. Uh, nonetheless, whenever, so that's probably a bad example, but uh, whenever the United States versus something, that's generally gonna be um, uh, authorized or delegated or at least have some uh, involvement with this with this attorney general as the chief lawyer of the U.S. Uh, and they're also, of course, going to give uh, uh, legal advice uh, to the executive branch. So if they're going to, I don't know, what do we say? If the president's thinking about issuing an executive order or doing something within a department, um, and they're wondering if that would be constitutional or not, or by what grounds it could be constitutional, like how you interpret it, they would uh, almost certainly seek the counsel or advice of the attorney general who would uh, give their opinion as to whether or not they think a particular action or interpretation is or isn't um, constitutional. So that's the Department of Justice. Um, Department of uh, Treasury is the last one we're gonna talk about. And that's going to be headed, to, uh, headed by the uh, Secretary of the Treasury. All right, uh, this one's much more of an economic advisor. Um, this one isn't as much of a, an authority figure as you might think, because in the United States it's not as simple uh, the way we have things set up economically. Uh, we have fiscal policy, if you remember this from economics, hopefully, fiscal policy, which is, of course, federal spending, um, government spending for the most part, uh, when they're trying to uh, lessen the blow of an, of an economic recession or depression or, or hardship. Uh, or they're trying to maintain a steadily growing economy. Um, when it's the government's money that's being handled and, and managed, then that's a, a, a fiscal policy issue. But we also have monetary policy, which is headed by um, or determined by the Federal uh, Reserve uh, uh, Board, and the Federal Reserve System. That's actually separate from this Department of the Treasury. So the Department of the Treasury uh, has some very specific duties. They're in charge of actually creating the currency. So they're the ones that uh, mint uh, the coins and print the paper money, which of course has to be signed by the Secretary of the Treasury and I believe also the head of the Federal Reserve Board. Don't quote me on that. I think they both have to. Regardless, uh, they're also the ones that um, uh, are going to, or at least the uh, Secretary of the Treasury is going to be in charge of doing things like suggesting economic policies um, to the president, and then of course they could be introduced as well as legislation to Congress. So they're going to uh, propose or advise um, economic policies. Now whether that is uh, specifically a fiscal policy, like Congress doing this or not doing that with money, or uh, um, changing tax laws, right, uh, to, uh, to, to incentivize or disincentivize certain activities, like if they want to incentivize business growth, they might uh, pass some sort of tax cut or tax rebate um, um, piece of legislation or bill through uh, Congress. If they want to disincentivize something, like the one thing that they're currently contemplating and trying to create is a carbon tax to reduce uh, carbon emissions, uh, that would also be something that goes through here. Um, so that is where they would uh, uh, propose those. 
is they can propose economic plans. And obviously the plan is for the benefit of the United States. These plans generally uh, are of course trying to uh, uh, protect or avoid uh, economic uh, recession in one form or another uh, or promote uh, growth. So they're the ones that try to devise these plans uh, and issue them and put them forward. So like, uh, what was the name of the plan? Uh, Trump's administration, uh, the Secretary of the, the Treasury helped create and propose this, what was it like the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act or something like that? I can't remember the exact name, but it's a very recent one, like uh, 2017, 2018. Uh, tax Cut and Job Plan, something like that. That might not be the exact name. But that was uh, crafted largely by the Secretary of the State and uh, his um, um, advisors. And of course, um, introduced to the President and then introduced to the Congress, uh, and that was passed. Um, when there was a uh, representative, uh, sorry, when there was a Republican majority in the House and the Senate. Um, right now, as of 2020, that almost certainly wouldn't work because we have a Democratic uh, majority in the House, so they wouldn't, would almost certainly not agree to a, a more conservative um, uh, economic policy. They might, you know, depending on the actual terms and, 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 and potential uh, compromise they make on the uh, bill, it can happen, uh, but the odds that even something like this can be introduced with a, <clears throat> a Democratic speaker, <clears throat> or certainly passed with a Democratic majority, are low, which can make it hard uh, for any president uh, because they have to, um, uh, and even their secretaries too, they have to keep in mind that if one or both of the houses are not aligned with their party, they're going to have to negotiate and, and make some compromises. And that's something that's becoming unfortunately increasingly difficult uh, as things become more partisan and tribal here in the United States. Hopefully in a few years that's dissipated and this, 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 me mentioning this in 2020 is irrelevant, but as of right now, it's a big issue. And that's not pointing the fingers at either party, by the way, it's pointing at both because they're both guilty of the exact same crime in that case. Not compromising, not working with one another and sort of seeing each other as uh, evil, uh, the other enemy team, <clears throat> however you want to phrase it. All right, um, so they're uh, gonna make a lot of decisions regarding state spending, or at least propose them. And they're gonna handle the details of it too, uh, because they're going to uh, head the departments that uh, collect tax revenue, for example. So they're in charge of collecting tax revenue. So uh, the IRS is under the uh, uh, Department of the Treasury. That's an executive department that's out there to execute the law. So the Congress makes the uh, tax uh, uh, fiscal policy, in this case taxes, uh, and then the IRS is the executive department that goes out and carries that out and collects them uh, actually. All right, so that's a good overview of the Department of the Treasury. One thing I want to distinguish, though, is the Secretary, not the Secretary of Treasury, the Department of the Treasury is the printing <clears throat> and uh, managing of money within the federal government, but the, uh, the Federal Reserve is different. Like I said, it's a monetary authority. They're the ones that are kind of like the bank for the Treasury. So all the securities the Treasury has, like um, bonds um, uh, and, and, and other... Um, uh, I'm totally blanking on, on the different securities they have. But if you're going to buy treasury bonds, for example, which is a form of, of security, right, which is like a, you purchasing a, an agreement that will be paid for with interest later uh, by the part of the treasury, the ones that actually hold and, and, and sell those and issue and release those uh, and, and make loans to the economy and to the government, that's going to be the Federal Reserve. So the Federal Reserve is sort of like the, uh, um, the U.S. Bank. What well, is it is, the U.S. Central Bank. It's the U.S. Bank. And the Department of the Treasury is the one that uh, manages uh, federal uh, spending and debt. And they're, they're, of course, the ones that also print the money, physically print it. So they have uh, two different roles, and that can be kind of confusing, and I, I don't know if I haven't really helped describe that, but just try to think of the, hmm, if the, Federal government is like a, a company that makes the decisions on how to spend things for the company and asks for loans and, and, and uh, uh, puts money in a certain research and development or production. That's like what the government does. Uh, but they don't actually hold the money. The ones that hold the money are the banks. The Federal Reserve would be like the bank for that company. So if they want a loan, they want to buy a bond, whatever they want to do, uh, if they want to get a, get a loan, they want to save money, whatever it is uh, they want to do, they have to go to a bank to get that. So they make the decisions for what the company does with money, but uh, they have to uh, generally get the money or get the loans from the bank. And that's like what the Federal Reserve does, the U.S., uh, the bank in the United States, the central bank, 
and the treasury is, like I said, the company that decides what to do with that money and how to get it. Um, I don't know if that helps, but hopefully it does. So that's, that's generally what these four departments are for. And like I said, there's 11 others. Um, and I did mention the, Homeland, uh, d the uh, Department of Homeland Security, which um, has a lot more attention directed towards it um, since the, uh, the, the whole immigration um, uh, what's the word of controversy uh, over the last three or four years with, with, with ICE and the, the border wall and all that stuff. But uh, for the most part, uh, those, are, those are what you need to know. You can look at the other ones if you want. There's like education, agriculture. Uh, there's all sorts of departments. Uh, but those are the, are the most important ones. So now let's move on to the final portion here, which is just kind of the remaining uh, powers and responsibilities the president has that we haven't quite talked about yet. So um, other powers, um, other powers and responsibilities. So, um, uh, and, and you might be wondering, like, what's the difference? Power is something they can do, and responsibility is something they, they, uh, they have to do to fulfill their job. So here's what they can do to fulfill their job. This is what they have to do to fulfill their job, and here's what they can do to achieve that. So one power they have, and this is actually one of the checks and balances too, uh, and this is an expressed power. The president, I'll put that in parentheses so we know, but it's not like implied. Uh, the president has the uh, power to pardon Crimes. Uh, pardon meaning if they feel, and, and presidents do this all the time, most presidents do this for several hundred people, um, if they feel that a ruling or law from the past <clears throat> was unfair, like for example, I know Obama, I don't know uh, what, what sort of um, pardons Trump's done lately, uh, but I, I know that Obama had quite a few that were, were pretty popular among people. A lot of people disagree with uh, the war on drugs, um, even if they agree that that certain drugs should be legal. Most agree that, um, or sorry, most disagree with the original sentencing for these nonviolent crimes. So like, you know, if you had some marijuana on you uh, in the 80s or 90s, the uh, punishment for that might be way more than is reasonable. And again, most people, or a lot of people think that it's not reasonable to have any punishment for just possessing and using marijuana on your own. Nonetheless, I think most people can agree if you have an ounce of it on you and you get like a 30 year prison sentence, that's a little excessive. Um, so, um, Obama, for example, went back uh, and reviewed a lot of uh, cases from previous years where they had these massive sentences for these nonviolent possession of drug crimes, uh, and he would um, uh, pardon them for it. Uh, so pardoning them, but you can also pardon other things, whether they think uh, a certain case was um, not, there was some prejudice in the case, or it wasn't fair, or new evidence popped up, whatever it might be, uh, they can go back and pardon them. Uh, if they feel that it's uh, necessary or right. Uh, they can also, um, oh man, what's the actual term for it? It's, uh, it's commutation, that's what it's called, commutation. That's where they reduce the sentence. Um, they can also uh, remit fines. So if you got fined for something that um, was, let's say it was an old law or uh, that uh, is no longer seen as, uh, much of a concern or important, or maybe it's no longer a law anymore, um, then uh, those, uh, they can, can cut or reduce the fines, or if the fines seem too excessive for whatever the crime would be, uh, they could do that. Or they could grant reprieve, which might mean delaying um, or reducing a sentence, uh, some of those factors. So that's definitely a judicial check. There is a, an asterisk to add to this uh, that does not apply to an, uh, impeachment proceedings, not applicable, applicable to impeachment. No pardoning for that. Uh, if the Senate impeaches you, or if the House uh, initiates proceedings and then the uh, Senate finds you guilty and removes you from office and or bans you from future government positions, the President can't do anything about that. They could, though, uh, absolve you of criminal or civil um, crimes. Uh, and that's what happened for Nixon when he resigned before being impeached, before he got impeached, and then he was pardoned by uh, four later. So they never got to pursue uh, the crimes of the whole Watergate scandal. All right. Oh, I should actually mention that, by the way. Uh, this can be a controversial, uh, generally speaking, it's not controversial. You're going to have certain people that may disagree or agree with a particular pardon. Um, but one form of controversial use uh, has been um, the um, uh, Nixon's uh, pardon. So there's a couple of issues in this that I wanted to mention that I forgot to mention earlier. Uh, Nixon's pardon was because he, well, there's a lot of things he did, but one of the things that he got in the most trouble for was 
the Watergate scandal, which you've probably heard the term of, the Watergate scandal. And I'll, I'll summarize it here. Uh, scandal in the early 70s. Um, caused him to resign. Um, uh, to, to sum it up, he basically used government resources and bribes to uh, unconstitutionally hire people to uh, tap into and, and, and find information uh, on the Democratic uh, National Commission, the Democratic Party. Uh, so he wanted to find out what their strategy was uh, so he could win the next election, more or less. Um, so he did that, it's super illegal. He can't use government resources to do that. The president can't be bribing criminals to engage in criminal activity. Uh, and when um, they found out about it and, and journalists started pursuing it, um, and the uh, courts were requesting his uh, tape, tapes of his phone calls and things like that, which would almost certainly incriminate him. <clears throat> he resisted and, and basically said no. Uh, and he claimed what is uh, called or referred to as executive privilege. And this is part of what a lot of presidents believe is implied within their powers is that they, even though they are a public official, and according to the Freedom of Information Act, uh, um, and other interpretations, most government stuff has to be released as far as what they're doing, what they're thinking about, and, and, and all that, and what their uh, actions and bills and acts are. But there are some things that are not public information uh, when they have to do with national security, for example. So what Nixon tried to claim was, well, first of all, he tried to claim invasion of privacy, like his own um, uh, First Amendment right, uh, which was dismissed. And then he also tried to argue that the executive privilege uh, means that the president has the right or the United States has the right to withhold info from public or other branches uh, for national security. <clears throat> and of course, when um, uh, the, the court started ruling against this, it became increasingly clear they were going to um, uh, initiate the impeachment trial. Uh, he resigned, and then uh, before any criminal charges could be placed against him or civil, uh, Ford it would, it would absolve him or exonerate him uh, with a pardon. So that is what executive privilege is. It's a highly, it's a controversial topic. Um, nonetheless, most people would agree that this is true to some extent, but certainly not the extent uh, or the uh, actions he was attempting um, to uh, uh, protect. Uh, with, through, through claiming this executive privilege. All right, so power to pardon. It's a check definitely in the judicial branch. It doesn't apply to impeachment, but it's been controversially used and uh, it's actually brought to issue this whole executive privilege thing about does the president have the right to withhold certain information? Because if they go through all the tapes trying to find uh, evidence against him for this, for this Watergate scandal, are they gonna uncover a bunch of national secrets that jeopardize the United States? Uh, it's not quite uh, as clear of an issue, nonetheless, uh, that's, that's uh, um, was a major point of contention uh, from the 70s. Okay, another power um, or responsibility he has, uh, or, the, or she, um, if we have a female president here in the near future. Um, oh, they are the ones that, we've talked about this before, but I just want to explicitly state this again. They are responsible for choosing, not approving, the Senate does that, but they choose Supreme Court justices, um, Ambassadors to foreign nations, those diplomats that we mentioned earlier, um, cabinet members, uh, and other government officials, high up officials. So they have a very important role there. Um, they are also responsible for, uh, but again, don't forget these are all going to be Senate approved. Uh, they also are responsible for uh, negotiating. Treaties, right, as part of their, uh, uh, along with their, uh, the Department of the State and their Secretary of State, they negotiate treaties. And again, they can't approve them, but they're the ones that are going to try to hammer out the details and form like non-binding verbal agreements and contracts uh, with, uh, with with other parties uh, and, and foreign entities. Negotiate uh, treaties, uh, they're non-binding uh, because the Senate approves, approved by the Senate. <clears throat> Because again, the, the, the Congress decides what we're going to do and the president uh, carries it out, right? That's, that's how it goes. And then of course, 
after the fact, when something's been passed or an action's been taken to enforce it, that's when, if it's brought to the attention of the Supreme Court, they can uh, rule it uh, unconstitutional or not through judicial review. All right, uh, so they negotiate those treaties. Um, another one that they have, um, I would say, going along with this, that the uh, president is the, uh, as the head of state, uh, he is going to be the uh, uh, international or national, I'll say national representative uh, to the world, the national figurehead to the world. So they really look to the uh, president for, for what the United States is doing uh, and what they're all about. And, uh, because the president is what they're doing. Um, Congress can make the laws and make the decisions, but uh, the president is the one that carries them out. So they're the ones that are actually interacting with uh, the world more directly. And it's a lot easier too, because you can just uh, put, a, put a name to a, a face of a single person. Uh, and they're the ones that have the authority uh, within their departments. And they're the ones, like I said, that, that take action uh, in the world. Congress isn't uh, an action taker. They're an action maker, uh, and then the uh, Supreme Court is one that reviews things. All right, uh, I really want that to get you get that across to you guys because that's one that really confuses students as far as the various roles. So hopefully this is helping you gather or form an understanding of how the three branches uh, sort of work together. Um, there is one thing I want to mention too before I move on to the next set that more focused on just between the president and Congress, uh, and that's our last set too, by the way. There is some question of does the president have the authority to break away from treaties or end them on their own terms? So the Senate clearly has to be the one approving them, but the issue becomes, and it's not that clear, uh, can president uh, end treaties on their own? Do they need Senate approval for that? Um, there have been different instances uh, across history uh, and different uh, opinions on whether or not they can, but that one's not clearly, that one's not self-evident based on the Constitution as it's written. Uh, so these are just uh, some other general powers and responsibilities they have. And don't forget this executive privilege one. Uh, that one's an important one. Uh, continues to be an important one uh, today. Okay, cool. So let's talk about the last sets of um, powers and responsibilities. And these ones are focused more on uh, being related or the relations to uh, Congress. So one thing that's stated in the Constitution is uh, from time to time, as it's worded, they're supposed to uh, uh, update the Congress on the State of the Union. So what that means is how things are going in the government, like what's going on, like how is the government carrying out, the executive branch should say, how are they carrying out the laws and policies of the Constitution and uh, those that are made by Congress? Uh, so they would give an update on the economy, what's being done, how it's being carried out, uh, what, what's going on, generally speaking, with military and spending, uh, you know, to, to however much detail they can divulge is of course, going to be uh, at their own discretion. Um, and, and just other features of the, uh, uh, of, the, of the government, the borders, immigration policy, um, uh, development of technology, education, et cetera, uh, freedom and liberty, uh, international relations. That's the sort of thing that they're going to uh, be uh, communicating uh, to the Congress. Uh, and this is going to take place at the State of the Union address, which is where um, the president <clears throat> gives a speech uh, in the uh, House chamber uh, to the House and the Senate, all of Congress, uh, and uh, the Supreme Court also attends, too, um, to Congress about the, um, the state of the nation. Uh, and that's generally, and again, there's no specific time, it just says from time to time uh, in the Constitution, but that's generally an annual event. They generally do that uh, once a year towards the beginning of the year, and they sort of update on, oh, here's how the year went, here's what we're planning to do um, as far as executing the laws uh, and enforcing the laws of the United States. Uh, that's what it generally is. Uh, so if you want to see those, uh, they're generally in January, uh, where you would uh, see a State of the Union address. They're a pretty big deal as far as um, being nationally televised and all of that. And I think in this last one, or was the one before, where uh, the Speaker of House, Pelosi, uh, did the thing where she like tore the speech up uh, that Trump was giving because those uh, Republicans and Democrats right now are pretty they don't get along we'll just we'll just say that much much worse to a much more severe degree than they have in the past so if you're watching this and you're a de Democrat or Republican or you're like me and you're you're apolitical uh, at least nonpartisan um, 
try to try to keep that in mind uh, because that is not a healthy development for any country to have two groups that just genuinely hate each other, don't listen to each other at all, um, and uh, only try to stop one another rather than compromise. It is it's just not a good way uh, to to manage a country. So hopefully hopefully that is peaking now, and then after this whole COVID thing, which I was hoping if it had anything positive coming out of it, would kind of like unify the country, and it is certainly not. It has also become a partisan issue, which is, which is quite unfortunate. So keep that in mind, guys, going forward. Let's, let's try to break that trend. Uh, realize that Republicans and Democrats can be wrong and right uh, at different points in time and history and on different issues, and even if they are wrong, forgive them. Uh, and if they are right, recognize it. <clears throat> Don't just hold on to don't, don't stick to your beliefs if you, if you think something's wrong or know something's wrong. All right, um, get a little philosophical now. Um, what other, um, oh, the president is also inclined to, this is a responsibility, uh, advise and suggest, I mentioned this before, legislation uh, to Congress. And they're also supposed to kind of represent the, um, uh, and communicate The uh, grievances of the executive branch, of not just the executive branch, the representative people, uh, the uh, citizenry. Now, the, the Congress is supposed to be the closest to the people anyway, uh, but uh, the president can and should be the one that comes forward and says, hey, we're having difficulties here, like as part of the State of the Union. They're the ones that are supposed to be knowing what's going on and how things are being enforced and carried out. Uh, so the president should ideally, through their advisors anyway, have the best idea of um, what the state of the union and the nation actually is, and they should have a, uh, a, a better idea or a more informed idea than anybody, through their advisors at least, as to what needs to be done. Uh, and this has happened many times in history where there's a, an issue, a problem going on, and obviously Congress is the one that makes the laws and, and, and the resolutions. But um, the president is is more than, than welcome and, and uh, uh, has a good authority, knowledge authority, on um, on what's going on in the nation. So they, they're the ones that can come forward and say, hey, we've got this issue, whether it's economic or militaristic, whatever, uh, and, and my advisors have gotten together and we've drafted this, we think this should be passed and here's why. Um, so they should be the ones that are proposing or suggesting uh, and creating or advising Congress on what to do and, and bills to pass. So some examples of um, executives, uh, presidents that have um, moved Congress uh, as far as uh, creating uh, or suggesting legislation uh, to fix or prevent uh, a pro current or, or future problem. Uh, some examples of that uh, would be um, FDR and the New Deal after the Great Depression. That's absolutely one that's uh, noteworthy, where uh, obviously the president uh, can only pass executive orders to enforce uh, laws um, uh, and constitutional powers they already have. They can't create laws. So FDR went out and said, hey, we got this depression issue. Um, so here's this uh, new Keynesian economic theory and policy and, and, and others that they added with their own economic um, advisors. So here's a bunch of laws we think we should pass. Of course, we now know these series of laws is the Great Deal, or it's not the Great Deal, the New Deal, uh, one and two. Um, and there's not really a whole lot of evidence for, for, that suggests it fixed the Great Depression. Uh, I don't think anybody's suggesting that, that knows what they're talking about. But uh, what it did showcase was um, that the president has a profound influence uh, on, uh, on Congress uh, and can propose things that uh, make suggestions that uh, the Congress uh, can listen to and, and pass. And again, even though this may not have worked out the way that, that we'd hoped, um, it's certainly a great example of, of um, the president looking at a problem, trying to come up with a solution, uh, and then proposing that in Congress, uh, reviewing it and, and pushing it through as well. Another example uh, along the same lines <clears throat> was Lyndon B. Johnson and his Great Society. This was the 1930s. In uh, his Great Society, this is 1964. Uh, and this is an issue where uh, uh, they wanted to reduce and end things like racial discrimination, which is a great goal. Um, and poverty also a great goal, and uh, not all the, the, the goals were achieved uh, with these with these uh, legislative policies uh, that were passed uh, under the Great Society uh, series of legislation. But Johnson uh, 
largely with his advisors drafted this legislation and uh, advocated it across the nation in various speeches, proposed it to Congress, and it got a lot of it pushed through. Uh, and while in both cases, a lot of these things uh, did, did not work and were eventually removed, but they were found in constitutional or other Congresses removed them because they were ineffective. Uh, they both have several things that were effective that stuck. So things that, and, and of course you can argue the degree to which these things are effective. Nonetheless, they are a foundational, fundamental part of the United States and they are not going anywhere. They're a third where, rail for politicians where if you try to uh, talk about removing them, it's the, the, the phrase third rail refers to like electric trains where the, the two rails maintain its balance <clears throat> and, and tread, but the third rail provides the power to touch the third rail you die. Um, the uh, uh, things like Medicare and Social Security, um, easier access to food stamps and welfare, like those aren't going anywhere, um, even if you hate them for whatever reason. Uh, and there's good evidence, by the way, that they are, as a social safety net, uh, beneficial. And we could argue about how beneficial they are and how to optimize them. Nonetheless, those were uh, proposed by presidents and passed by Congress, which really shows the, the scope and um, um, influence that the president can have uh, by exercising this responsibility to advise Congress on the problems and suggest solutions and legislation uh, for, for Congress to uh, authorize and, and pass. Um, those are both democratic examples. If you want some um, examples that were not democratic or republican to be more, I guess you could say, fair uh, politically, uh, you had both uh, President Bush and more recently Donald Trump. Uh, they both are going to uh, propose uh, tax cut legislation uh, as a means to uh, enhanced uh, economic activity. Uh, Reagan also uh, had that same line of thought and influence. Uh, so those are some examples. Uh, and you can absolutely look at all of all five of these presidents and the legislation they put forward uh, that was passed by Congress and point various parts that worked and didn't work. Uh, what I don't want you to do is get all the partisan and tribal and think, these were great, these were terrible, or these were great, these were terrible. Nope, look into it. Just look and see which which one, which policies made things better or improved American life or the economy, which ones made it worse, because they all have elements that certainly did. Uh, another example would be Obama uh, and his um, uh, uh, National Health Care, uh, Affordable Health Care Act. Most people just call it Obamacare. Uh, health Care Act. Uh, that was, of course, drafted by uh, him and his advisors, uh, uh, placed before Congress, and, and Congress passed it. So the president's scope uh, of power is, is is substantial. Again, they can't make the laws, but they can certainly advise Congress and propose legislation. And it's happened many times in history where influential pieces of legislation are passed at the uh, request or advice of the president. All right. <clears throat> so um, what else we got then? Is that all I want to talk about? You have the veto power. I feel like I'm forgetting one that we've already mentioned before. Uh, as well as the pocket veto, just in case you forgot real quick. Uh, when Congress passes a, a, a bill or a resolution, it's placed before the president. They have 10 days to either sign it or not sign it into law, and then it would become a law in both cases. Uh, or they can return it to Congress with their own suggestions, which would be the veto. Uh, and if they do that when Congress is out of session, uh, then it would be a pocket veto because they return it to Congress and they don't take action, so the bill would die. Uh, so those are two powers they have as checks. And, um, oh, last one. They ha can call special sessions of Congress. Now, they can't compel Congress to do anything, but they can compel them to meet and to talk about an issue. So they can call special congressional uh, sessions. There we go. So again, can't compel them to do anything but they can uh, compel them to meet. <clears throat> and this would be obviously, if Congress is already in session, this wouldn't apply. But let's say Congress is not in session um, because you know Congress can't be in session year round. They've got to have uh, breaks as well. They're regular humans. Um, <clears throat> if they're uh, out for whatever reason and some sort of emergency uh, surfaces, whether it's uh, a pandemic or it's an economic uh, issue, uh, recession, decline, whatever, uh, whether it's a, um, uh, a peacekeeping issue or a, a, a national security threat uh, like the, the, the Tonkin uh, Gulf uh, resolution. Um, like, you know, something happens and they're like, oh no, we need a decision on this. So they call Congress together to make a decision on going to war, not going to war, whatever. Uh, granted the president war powers, whatever it might be. Uh, they can call the sessions. Again, can't compel them to make 
a particular decision, but they can call them and say, hey, there's a pressing emergency issue. Uh, we need a, a decision on this so that I, uh, as the executive, uh, can act on it. Uh, and then they would deliberate and pass a resolution. Uh, and again, resolution and bill are largely the same thing. The only difference is resolution is generally to continue uh, an existing bill or to like address some quick emergency uh, pressing issue uh, rather than a regular bill, which would go through a long you know, hearing and markup process and would take a long time. Resolutions are generally quicker to uh, try to respond to a, a pressing immediate issue. So that's kind of it. Uh, those are generally the uh, powers and roles of the executive branch. And if you've got an understanding of that, you have a really good understanding of what's going on in the world uh, and politically. And if you're an AP Gov, this is probably pretty insightful. In fact, I know it's pretty insightful uh, as far as knowing more than you have to uh, and having a firm understanding of the presidency as long as as well as its uh, uh, historical uh, development um, and constitutional uh, powers. Mm -hmm.